Hello everybody, welcome to Create with Chris. We are here today in my studio and today's lesson or session is going to be Floating 101 where we talk about how to easily uh, float and get some really fantastic results. So let me introduce myself. I am Chris Hoy. I am the owner and founder of Cupboard Distributing, um, CD Stencils, Chris Hoy Designs. I am a designer, painter, and um, owner and founder of Scrapbook Outlet. So kind of keeps my days busy. Love to paint, love to create and design. So um, I, and this is where we get a lot of self-satisfaction and fulfillment, especially during these crazy times when we're spending a lot of time trying to figure out what to do with our time. And I think it's so important when we paint to be able to get the results that we want. And hopefully we'll touch on a few things today that'll make uh, your painting and floating just a little bit easier. So let's go ahead and get started. What exactly is painting and floating? shading and highlighting, there's a lot of terminology. I think that what I have discovered out of everything that we do in decorative painting, this is where the magic begins. This is what just makes a huge difference. And if you can master the technique of floating, you know, it just creates fantastic, beautiful results. And Every time I paint, I never cease to be amazed at what a big difference just a little bit of paint makes. Um, it doesn't take great big um, volumes of paint or huge strokes to really create the magic. And I, I hope that's what we can kind of cover today. Just a little bit of paint um, and the way that you apply it, the, the tools and techniques that you use, these are the key elements that will make painting and floating so much easier. Um, there's a lot of tricks and tips that I can share with you, but it's just like everything else. The more you practice, the more you do it, unfortunately, um, the easier it will be become. So you're gonna have to do your practice homework and get very, very comfortable, but um, what I kind of want to share with you today is how to let your tools and your brushes do the work and you just drive the vehicle so that you can watch everything unfold before your eyes. And I, I just, again, every time I do this floating and shading and highlighting, I think, wow, what a huge difference this makes. And it, it's just so exciting and fun to watch something go from plain and flat to shaded and rounded and just see that light bounce off of it. It's, it's just truly amazing. So let's go ahead and get started. Let me flip over here to my... Can you see that, Lindsay? Not yet. Okay. I'm a little bit behind. All righty. I'm not sure what this is. And you might want to tell them I'm here. Oh, Lindsay is here. But and I'm she... me. I'm not cover distributing. <laughs> oh, <laughs> she is here and she's monitoring. So if you have any questions, be sure to let Lindsay know. And I'm not seeing my screen, Lindsay, at all. I just have a blank here. Yeah, you should. But nothing's moving. Oh, did it lock up? I think so. Okay, this is another reason I have Lindsay here. Um, she's my IT person that makes sure everything is go working. Out, come back in. Uh, okay. Oh wait, okay, try going back again. It's still locked up, I think. Yeah. It's the iPhone. No, it's fine. Yeah. Okay. Uno momento. We're gonna go back to Lindsay here, or two, yeah. Lindsay's gonna work her magic and make sure everything is connected. She knows all the secret things to do. There See, you. I told you she would do it. Yeah, look at that. Oh my gosh. Better? Hello. Yeah, here we are. <laughs> okay, back to floating and shading. And um, one of the key things that is most, most important is starting with good brushes. And it's just like anything else. Um, if you don't have the correct tools, if you don't have 
quality tools, you're not going to get quality finishes. And also, if you don't have quality brushes, you're going to have to work really, really hard to try to make it look good. So save yourself a little bit of stress. Get some good brushes. And I, I know you have to invest to get good brushes. I've had this brush for about a year. I use it heavily every time I paint, but I take really good care of my brushes. I clean them well after I'm finished. When you start getting paint built up in the ferrule down here, the bristles start to splay out. Um, that's when you, you lose your sharp chisel edge. Another thing that can wear bristles out is if you're painting on a rough surface, um, I suggest, and uh, this is a Moderna brush. Um, retail on this is about $4.99, okay? This is what I use. This is what I call my workhorse. So if you're needing a brush just to do some rough work, you know, get some less expensive brushes to do the bulk of that work. Save your really good brushes and you'll get really smooth, beautiful strokes. And that's what you want to aim for, just having those beautiful strokes. So you wanna make sure you've got a nice chisel edge, no matter whether you use a flat or whether you're using an angle. My preference is an angle. I use an angle for about everything. I love the versatility of the angle, this little point I can get in little areas. And in my mind, the bigger the brush, the more area I can cover and the less brush strokes that are going to be visible and the less work I'm going to have to do to blend it in. So I try to go with as big of a brush as I, as the area I'm painting can accommodate. Um, if you're going to a smaller area, you're going to need to bump down to a smaller brush to make sure that you can have better control and you can get in those little teeny tight areas. Um, another key element in floating and shading is the amount of water that is on your brush and i know you hear this from every teacher you got to have your brush loaded correctly if your brush is not loaded correctly you're not going to get good strokes you want to be able to have a nice long fluid stroke if you don't have enough water on your brush you're gonna run out of paint. You're gonna get those little short choppy strokes. Then you're gonna have to work hard, try to blend them in. Oh my goodness, we don't wanna work that hard. We wanna make this easy and smooth and just let the brush do all that work. And then all you're gonna be doing is creating and having fun. Alrighty, now let's go ahead and get some paint out here. And I think what I'm gonna do, let me see if I can bump out a little bit here. Um, I was trying to figure out what color to use and I'm thinking that a darker color is gonna give more contrast. So I'm gonna go with uh, Prussian Blue and just kind of get a little puddle out. I'm not gonna use much. Now, when I load my brush, how do you know how much water is the proper amount of water. All right, so if it's drippy wet, it's gonna to be too soupy, you're gonna know that right away. If it's too dry, you're not gonna get much of a stroke. So what I normally do is dip it in my water basin and just kind of tap it on my paper towel. It's gonna to suck up that extra moisture. And I don't know if you can tell, when it comes out of the water bucket, it's super glossy. Let's see if you can zoom in a little bit more here. All right, when I bring it out of the water basin, let me find my camera here. Okay, it's super glossy, there we go. See how shiny that is? When I lay it down, you see how it sucks that moisture right out and it goes kind of flat or kind of a mat. Still wet, if I run it over my finger, you're gonna see moisture, but it's not dripping or running down. To load my brush, and I tell you, I didn't shake my paint well, so I have a lot of that um, binder in there. I'm gonna put another puddle out just to make things less confusing here. Always shake your paint well. I thought I had. Okay, that looks a little bit better there. 
so I'm just going to run the edge of my brush into the paint. I'm not gonna poke it down in the middle. Um, when I poke it down in the middle, I kind of get a lump or an edge, a roll of paint on this left side. I don't want that. I want it to be nice and smooth. And I keep blending it out on my palette so you can see that um, one side's dark and it just gradually lightens up that ombre effect that we want. I like to load it up pretty well. Go ahead and do both sides. That way when you're painting, if you wanna flip your brush over, it's already prepped. If you only load one side, this back side, if you don't blend it out, it's gonna have that streak on it. You want that just really soft look. Every time I load, I'll go back to this area. I don't go all over my palette and put, you know, stroke work. You, you know if it's right. You can see it goes from dark to light. I can go over here, have a really super nice blend. And if you want a wider float, you just walk it to the left and you can move it over. Always want to maintain the clean edge of the brush on this back side. I call this the heel, that's the toe. The heel will always be clean. If it is not, all you have to do is just clean your brush and um, Trying to get a little bit brighter light on that. Clean your brush. Make sure you maintain that nice gradient transition from dark to light. And I go back and I can reload and reload and reload. Now I've got quite a bit of paint on my brush, so I should be able to paint. Let me go out just a little bit. There we go. I should be able to paint quite a long distance before I have to reload. And I'm just gonna go right along the edge and see I can go back and forth, get a really nice float before I have to reload. So that's one way you can float the paint on. Another way I like to do is to get a little bit more of a interesting blend of paint or shading of paint on there. And I loaded my brush, I dipped it in the water and I'm loading it and floating it on my palette. I didn't jump all around. I'm using this puddle over here, still, excuse me, still a little bit wet. So I can kind of reload my brush by using that same paint over and over. I like to do what I call a choppy float shade which is where I just go back and just kind of float that in. And you can see I'm getting just a little bit of a, more of a, um, not a solid float. It's a little more interesting, a little more texture in there, but it kind of looks like a little bit of, you can see the brush strokes. It's just not that smooth, perfect float. That's kind of my style and I really like that. I can work this out and really fill that in because uh, my paint is wet, I can go back and blend it in. I'm not gonna have a really heavy start and stop area and get that all smooth and even. And my paper is curling. I varnished both sides so that it wouldn't curl but it's gonna do it anyways. So you can tell the difference between this type of float where it's a little bit loose and this one where it's smooth and even. And I'll flip over to this because this shows you how that loose stroke, when you build it up in layers, I went from light blue to dark blue. It really starts to bring in that, that depth and that deepness. over this. I'm going to dry this just a little bit and I'll show you what I mean with that. I go back in. That was Prussian blue. Let's go back in with a little bit darker and this will be Payne's gray. I'm using the same color. I really didn't clean my brush out super well. Again, I'm going to load my brush and just work that paint into the bristles. 
I have a whale of a brush. So just to get a dip of it on my thing and, and tap it, it's not gonna give me much strength of painting. It's just gonna be a little short stroke. And I want a lot, I've got a big brush. I wanna go miles with this thing before I have to reload. So now I've got this and I can go back in and start to deepen that shading. It's not quite dry, should I have dried it a little bit more? But you can see how it's starting to darken down that float that was already on there and give a little more depth to that. And that's how you can build up, look how nice this is. This is kind of wet here in the corner, let me dry that. You know, it feels dry and then you put moisture on it and you're gonna lift the prior paint up. Not good. I get a little more water on my brush. Load that on there. I'm gonna go in and fill this corner in. See how I can just pull that out, really deepen up that shading. Give a lot of depth. I like dark corners. But look how that's starting to really resonate with that the deepness and that little bit of um, stroke work in there with that choppy float instead of the smooth stroke. This is an excellent way to give that depth of light to dark. And I, like I said, I, this is a three quarter inch angle. It's a beautiful Joe Sonia brush, absolutely fantastic. You get these nice bristles that have all that bounce and life to them good brushes. You know, if you want to have good results, good brushes is really, really important. When you are floating, another thing, good thing to remember, and I've seen this done before, we load our brush up, get that paint on there nice and perfect the way you want it. When you go to float, don't stay up on the toe of your brush and just try to pull a straight line down because that's all you're going to get is a straight line. You want all of your bristles to be nice and flat and push them down. You, you know, let that brush really work. You can go a long way with one float. And you can go back on this side and do the back-to-back -back floats and get that really nice dark center just by double loading, doing the back-to-back -back float. I think I'm pulling more paint off. I'm gonna flip it around here. There's always one way that you shade or float or stroke work that's gonna be a little bit easier than the other. Let that work for you. You need to understand and learn what works best for you. Now, if I'm floating and I get my float on there, and I'm not real happy with the way this side looks over here. I'm gonna make it kind of messy here. I got a little bit of a choppy mess over here. You can go in with a soft mop and just tap that down and soften that blend out. I know if uh, a lot of gals struggle with blending, this is a great way to achieve that soft blended look without having to struggle with floating in, in smaller areas or tight areas, or it, you know, if you want it to be just a perfect smooth float, um, this a mop will work really, really well to soften that. Another option is to dampen your paper first with moisture and I'm just going over it with water and I can add a little moisture in that. Gonna load my brush and get just a little bit on there and I can float and you can see how smooth that is. And the moisture on the paper or on the surface is just gonna very softly blend that out. And I can go down and just keep going over that until I get as wide 
or as small of a float as I want. Make sure when you load your brush, I know a lot of, uh, kind of messy there, um, a lot of what I've read or listened to says to load about half of your brush with paint. I would say a third, maybe even a fourth. You want the bulk of your paint on this left side. I'm right-handed. If you're left-handed, it's probably the other side. And then I can really blend that out and make sure that you work both sides. You've got really nice brush with lots and lots of bristles. When you're going like this back and forth, you're working the paint into your brush and it's not just on the outside bristles. That's what you want. You want a brush that's really going to um, create that beautiful shade for you. Again, this, let me go over here. Where are we at here? Okay, this right side is mostly clean. That gives me a lot of options of moving the paint around. So when I go in, if I think, oh, I wanna go over here, I can go back and clean that up very easily. Whoops, sorry. I can go down and around and back over and get a super, super nice float on that. I can go back over it a lot because my brush is wet enough that I can really manipulate that paint and I've got time to make it dry, to, before it, it dries, to move it around, to play with it, to really create um, that effect that I'm going for. Again, I'm gonna load just a little bit of my brush, I'm working in that same stroke area. I can go in here, I've kind of put a circle down here and I can go around the edge and then I can go back and, oops, take my time and just really clean that edge up. And I'm just kind of pivoting that brush around so that I can get that really nice soft float. Someone asked, if you are left-handed, do you load the heel of the brush? No, if you're left-handed, you still use the toe, but you're gonna go, oh, this is very awkward for me. You're gonna be going this way. I would go this way. Left-handers are gonna go that way. So you'll still load the toe, still keep it very, very um, clean on this back end of the brush. That's your secret, keep that clean. Once the paint starts to walk across that chisel edge, oh my goodness you're gonna lose that gradient float. So you wanna make sure a little bit of paint on the toe of your brush, work it in on both sides so that you have a nice load of paint in your brush that you can float out. I can go that way, I can, I'll go up here. I can go down and I can also go up. And I'm still gonna get that same beautiful float whether I go up or down. And you wanna be able to use that brush. If I decide, if this is clean, if I decide, ooh, I wanna go in there and clean that up, I can go in there and use that clean part, go back in here. I don't know why I'd wanna do that, but if I wanted to create like a little jig jag, I've got that clean part of my brush that I just clean that out with. And I often use that clean part of my brush as a little wipeout tool um, to help manipulate the paint. You wanna make sure you have enough moisture. You can move it around, walk it around, blend it. Um, it's not gonna be soupy or runny, but you still wanna be able to move that paint. Once it starts to dry, you're not gonna be able to go back in and do much to it. But as long as you're still working in that area, you need enough moisture on your brush that you can really play for a little while on that until you get it smoothed out. 
get it looking exactly the way you want to um, want it to end up being. Now, for you gals and guys that are in those arid states out west where the air is super dry and it ends up um, drying before you, <laughs> and I taught in uh, Arizona, New Mexico, and by the time I finished talking about how the paint was going to be applied, it was dry on my brush. So there are mediums, there are extenders and blending mediums that will help paint to go on smoother and easier. I don't usually like to work with those. I don't, I don't feel like I have a need, but if it makes your painting life easier, oh, by all means, you know, use whatever works. And then you, you may come to a point where you're thinking, yeah, I, I think I've got this now. Um, I don't need to worry about using uh, different mediums, whatever works best for you. And I do think a big part of the floating success is how you load your brush and how, you, how much water is on your brush and the type of brush that you use. And I can go around this whole thing very quickly because I have my brush loaded well. And I can go into this and blend it because this isn't dry yet. I can work that quickly. What really helps also is having this nice big brush to apply all that on there with very quickly. Again, I will go back when I'm shading and floating, sometimes three, four, five times to get that buildup of color on this particular piece. I have started out with a green, then I went to a blue, like a Salem blue or a lighter blue. Then I went to a medium blue, a darker blue, and I think I ended up with Payne's Gray. So you're getting a really nice uh, gradient color in here. If you wanna do a wider, still going in that same place, a wider float, start out further out and work that paint over, walk it over. Don't try to get the first layer of shading perfect if you're going to go back and keep adding more depth to it because each layer is going to help fill that in, strengthen it, and even if you use the same color, I'll put a couple layers of this um, Prussian blue on there. This first shading is not too terribly impressive. Let me get a little more Prussian out here. Kind of been playing on my palette and I've made a mess here. I can add another layer. And I'm just kind of doing that tap flow. That just works for me. I kind of let the brush kind of skip over and create that shading. You see how it's starting to um, evolve into a darker shading? And we'll add a little more heat on. This is my heat it tool. I like this so well because number one, it's not too noisy and it's super hot. I always keep my fingers here so that I, if it's too hot for my fingers, I know it's gonna be too hot for my paint. I'm gonna put another layer of this fresh and blue on there. I let my brush get a little dirty or a little, yeah, too much paint on it. See how that's, I'm not, I mean, this is so pretty. Just one color, several layers, build it up, build it up, build it up. This is a great way to practice um, shading and floating adding thin layers. You, you will be amazed at how much more professional and how much more depth that you'll get with just adding a few layers as opposed to one nice float on there. I'm going to jump into Payne's Gray and I'm going to deepen that corner just a little bit more and pull that out. And that's 
so pretty. And I think that richness that that dark color brings in really strengthens and helps create that contrast between the dark and the light. So I've added another little key um, element to successful floating shading is going from one color float over here to adding a little more strength to that. And look how you can build up those gradient from dark to light. And all of a sudden it's really starting to become very rich and very uh, painted and uh, gives that beautiful glow. I always am fascinated. One of the things that I think it looks absolutely awful are my candy canes. I am a terrible candy cane painter until I put my shading on, then I'm happy with it. But um, getting perfect stripes and lines is just very difficult for me. But I'm telling you, before I put the shading on this candy cane, it looked really, really awful. And um, I used a couple colors on the shading. I didn't just use one color, put a little bit of, uh, you know, one color on and then a deeper color. It really elevates it to, to a whole other level when you start adding different shades of color on this candle. Um, this has different colors of red in it, but also paints gray. Look how that really pushes that dark down in there. And in here, purples, and you know, you get just that different look. There's purple in here and paints gray. I probably tucked the little red in there. All these floats of color just really start to make these elements separate and come to life. Alrighty, so we have, let's go back to kind of wrap this up a little bit. <laughs> Here I am. Um, start out with really good brushes. It's well worth it to invest in brushes. If you want to save certain ones for just floating and shading, you can do that. I use mine, um, I, I don't paint on textured surfaces very often. So if you just have a really good uh, cleaning regimen that you clean your brushes and keep them, the bristles nice and perfect, your brushes should, should last a very, very long time. Take care of them, they'll be your best friend. Um, so you wanna have good brushes, take very good care of them, load them with enough water and if you're struggling with your floats, you probably don't have enough water in it. So take a look, make sure that your brush is flat on the surface. You're not using the tip of it. You wanna flatten it, let all of those brushes or all of those bristles accommodate that float. Don't just load a, a gob of paint on there and expect it to float out. Work that paint into your bristles. Make sure that you have a clean like at least half of your brush is clean. Let that paint flow from that dark to the light, give you that just beautiful transition. And make sure that you um, keep that, what's my other one? Keep the, keep the brush um, flat on the palette. Did I already say that? Keep the bristles clean and clean it out every time if they, that paint migrates across the chisel edge of it. Keep that sharp chisel edge. Let those brushes do all of the work for you. And practice, you know, if you're not getting good floats, practice, look at what you're doing and see if you're putting your brush down. See if you're using all of the bristles. See if you're, how you're putting the paint on there if you have enough water. It's not difficult, but I'm telling you, I think floating and shading is just the magic that makes everything come together in decorative painting. So if you can master floating and shading, you've got this. There's nothing you can't make look fantastic. So any questions, Lindsay? Mm -hmm. Everyone's a lot of thrill. This helps out. Um, Elena said going from oils to acrylics, floating was my challenge now, no problem. 
and I, I do think that, you know, once you get the hang of this, it's exciting. I've been painting for 30, 40, anyway, a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and I still get excited when I create something and I think, wow, this is so cool. And um, it, it's just, this is why we do what we do. We love it. We can't help ourselves. Suchetta is... says you look beautiful. Oh, thank you, Suchetta. <laughs> Okay, so we are, I think we're finished talking about floating. If you have any questions, let me know, chris at cdwood.com. I'd be more than happy to try to help. And um, we had talked about doing Create With Chris before Christmas, uh, doing some of these 101 kind of back to basic stroke work and the floating and shading and that type of thing. So that's where I'm gonna be trying to hit on some different things that maybe are a challenge. Maybe there's some way that I do it that might make it easier for you. I like to try to, to um, explain a couple different methods. What works for you may not work for me, etc. So try different things. I really encourage you. I love to travel teach with um, different groups because I, I learn so much. There's things that, um, you do that I think, wow, what a great idea. So sharing, you know, really um, keeping your eyes open. And it's great that we have Zoom right now because we can do classes and learn from in the comfort of your home without having to go anywhere. Uh, speaking of Zoom classes, I do have one coming up. This is my Lucky Nomicon. I don't know if you can see that. It's gonna be Friday, February 19th, and this is our little <laughs> gnome leprechaun. He's kind of cute, and there's a lot of techniques on there that, that are really fun. Um, I'm not a fussy painter, so uh, I like to just really have fun with what we do and um, not make a big deal out of it. I have another one coming up too. This is um, not online yet, but I think it should be up tomorrow. This is my, oh, here we go. This camera throws me off. Home Sweet Home. It's a Zoom class on March 12th. And, I, oh, I had so much fun with this. This is cotton bowls. So there's a lot of great technique. I don't know if you can see. It's just super fun. Uh, this technique of um, distressing. And it's on a stand, so it stands up. Peek around there. And this is gonna be a really fun class as well. That's gonna be in March. So keep your eyes out open for that. It's really gray. The screen, oh, it's, it's blue. It's kind of a blue, it's yeah. not gray. So yeah, colors on camera are really different. I think it's the background. Um, this is my design club ornament for January. If you're not uh, familiar, I do have a Christmas ornament design club. Six times a year you get the uh, pattern, the surface, all the instructions, color photos, step-by-steps, and everything's available on Cumbert Distributing's website, cdwood.com. I put links in the chat. And Lindsay's putting links in the chat, and you can go to that and check it out. I've been doing some Easter things. They're not online yet, but I wanted to share. This is my marshmallow bunny. Um, this should be up, hopefully, as soon as I get the line drawing done. You know, I don't like she line doesn't drawings. doesn't like line drawing. And I don't know if this one will go on or this is um, another one I just finished up. This one is on, right, Lindsay? Yes. Okay, this one is available. Um, and I think, well, I did, I did a free pattern. These are the shelf sitter blocks. Let's see if I can hold these up. And these are for St. Patrick's Day. Um, but then I decided the other side needed to be Easter. So these will be the St. Patrick's Day is a free pattern. And you can go online and load that, uh, download that. Um, the Easter one's gonna be coming up real soon. This, this is the rest, there's five blocks. This is the, the other of the Easter bunny and then that's the pot of gold and the St. Patrick's Day. I've been real busy. Um, I did, this a free pattern? Yep. This is a free pattern I did. Kind of, I honestly have never done St. Patrick's Day before, but this year I decided to do some um, 
St. Patrick's Day patterns. And I kind of got on a roll. So this is another free one. And since I was in the St. Patrick's Day mood, um, I do my series of gnomes. And this is my um, shenanigans gnome St. Patrick's Day piece. I'm working on Easter now, too. Is this a free one, too? It's not up yet. It's not up yet, but I did this one, too. <laughs> and this is kind of fun. This will be a free one as well. And I, I think it's fun. I, I think everybody enjoys just sitting down and creating something that's not going to take hours and hours and hours to do. Great gift ideas, you know, just some uh, technique involved in it. It's a lot of fun to create. Um, bring the grandkids over, nieces, nephews, whatever, and they can all create these. I work with my grandkids and they love using stencils and stamps because um, it's so much fun to create with. So I think this Valentine's almost over, but here's uh, Kissing Booth. I don't know, that was fun too. That's a free pattern online as well. Whew, I've been busy. I've been working really hard. And any of the new ones that aren't up are going to be done by the end of the week, right, Chris? Yeah, any of the new ones that aren't up will we be. We will trap her at yeah. her drawing table. Yeah, I, they, yeah they show Put me no the mercy. <laughs> They're in the corner. <laughs> So that's, I don't sleep at night. I have to do all this at, at downtime. Um, so what else? Mark your calendars for um, upcoming classes. Uh, let me know if you have any questions on floating. That's kind of what we're here today talking about. So if you have any requests for future technique classes, let me know and we'll um, see what we can work out on that. Check out our website for a new product. Uh, we've We've had tons of new product coming out. Just seems like all of a sudden there's all this new stuff. But I think we're ready. And after Christmas, and I know here in Ohio, the weather is nasty and cold, and we need things to do inside where it's nice and warm and cozy. It's not nasty. Oh, Lindsay loves the snow. I'm not a fan. <laughs> My hands are cold in the summertime. You can imagine what they feel like in the wintertime. So, okay. Well, thank you for joining me today. Again, if any questions, you can send them to Chris at cdwood.com. Go to our website, www.cdwood.com. Uh, covered distributing. We have surfaces, paint brushes, everything you need. Nothing's at full retail, so you always get a good deal. Check out, um, if you're not signed up for our newsletters, be sure you sign up. We have great sales every week, fun videos, so... Make sure you keep an eye on what we're up to because we're always up to no good. <laughs> no, we're not. We always Someone have suggested slip slapping. Slip slapping. Oh, yeah, that's a great technique and amazing what difference that will make. So, yep, we'll do that for sure. Okay, well, have fun. Practice your floating. And everybody will be a pro next time we get together. We'll talk about some more fun things to do. Thank you for joining me today on Create with Chris, and we'll get together again shortly. Bye-bye.